Well, happy Easter, everyone. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, this isn't the way that we envision that we would be celebrating this high point in our Christian faith, is it? I mean, we should be gathered here together in community. We should be lifting up our voices in worship and praise of our resurrected King and Savior, Jesus. All our Easter plans seem ruined, don't they? The family gatherings and the meals, the Easter egg hunts, all canceled because of COVID-19 and these unprecedented times of self-isolation and social distancing. At Easter, we remember Jesus Christ actually came into the world during a pretty bleak time in history. We remember that he suffered and died for the sins of humanity, but then he resurrected to new life to give us hope that there is light in the midst of darkness. And I find it interesting that Easter falls right in the middle of some of the worst days of this pandemic in Canada. This is some of the darkest times in the history of our country. And it's at times like this that we need to be reminded that darkness does not get the last word in our lives. Jesus Christ has risen from the grave, and that's what gives us hope for today and promise for a better future, a better future that lies ahead for us. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And it's also a time like this that we can become aware that our lives actually intersect with two stories. In our story, we have the pain and we have the economic disaster of the pandemic. And in the other, in God's story or the Easter story, we have God's provision and redemption for his people. Now, both of these stories matter in our lives. Both of these stories impact us. But the challenge for us may just be, which story do we choose to live in? Do we choose to live in our own story? Or do we choose to live in the story of Easter, of God's story? Like many of you, I'm sure I've been bombarded by news and editorials and articles coming at me through email and social media over the past few weeks. But one that got my particular attention was actually written by Microsoft founder Bill Gates, of all people. Maybe you saw it. I'm not familiar with Gates' faith background, but he states in the article that he believes that despite the chaos of our world today, there is a spiritual purpose behind everything that happens. It's the collision of two stories, God's story and our story. In the article, Gates lists some ways he believes the COVID virus is affecting us. Let, let me just share a few examples of what he stated. He said, it's reminding us that we're all connected and something effect that affects one person has an effect on the other. It's reminding us that these borders that we put up have little value because the virus is not in need of a passport. It's reminding us of how precious our health is and how many of us have neglected it. It's reminding us of how short life is and the importance of helping each other, especially the sick and the vulnerable. It's reminding us of how materialistic our society has become. And when times of difficulty hit, it's only the essentials that we really need. It's reminding us of how important family is and how important our home life is. And some of us have forgotten this. Forcing us back into our home gives us an opportunity to change all that. It's reminding us to keep our egos in check. See, no matter how important we are or how important we think we are, this can stop the world. It's reminding us that, we, that the power of free will is in our hands, that we can choose to cooperate and help each other, to share and to support each other, or we can be selfish and only think of ourselves. See, difficulties tend to bring out people's true colors. And it's reminding us that although COVID-19 virus is seen as a great disaster, it may just be the great corrector. It reminds us of the important lessons that we've seemed to have forgotten, and now it's up to us whether we want to change it or not. Now, maybe you agree or disagree with some of these points, but I think they do give us a bit of pause for thought that we do live in two stories. This year, as we approach Easter, we're maybe approaching it more from a, a lament point of view than a celebration. And that's okay, because God can meet us in a powerful way in our laments when we choose to live in his story. As many of you know, we're in a message series in the book of Psalms during this season of Lent, Way back in September when we were planning this series, we thought, what better book of the Bible to be in when we're reflecting and pondering Easter than the book of Psalms? Little did we know what would transpire in our world come Easter this year. But I think there's no better book of the Bible to be in than in the book of Psalms at this time. Today on this Easter weekend, we come to Psalm 118, and it's a thanksgiving psalm, but it's also a song of worship. 
It, it really reveals the hearts of God's people who, like us, find themselves entwined in two stories, in God's story and in their own. And their own story at this time was a pretty difficult situation. Maybe you remember a literary device I shared with you a few weeks ago that's important to make note of when we're reading Scripture. It's called an inclusio. When a text begins and ends with the same phrase, it's an inclusio. And that's what we find in Psalm 118. Psalm 118 at verse 1, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And then it ends at verse 29 with the exact same phrase. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And that's an important theme that's reiterated all throughout Psalm 118. Thankfulness to the Lord, for he is good. And he is good because his faithful love endures forever. This phrase, faithful love, in other translations it says steadfast love. It represents a special wording in Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament. It's often translated as loving kindness or mercy. It's the kind of love that never gives up on people. It's the kind of love that keeps on loving no matter what. It's the kind of love that's demonstrated by the father to his son in the story of the prodigal son. It's the kind of love that is not here today and gone tomorrow. It's not dependent on circumstances. It endures forever. And that's the kind of love that the Lord has for his people, for us. Look how the author highlights this special kind of love of the Lord in the first four verses of Psalm 118. At verse 1, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let all of Israel repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Let Aaron's descendants, the priests, repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Let all who fear the Lord repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Let North Park Church repeat, his faithful love endures forever. See, this is when I miss you being in front of me. His faithful love endures forever. Do you believe that? Have you experienced God's faithful love in your life? And why is the psalmist here encouraging everyone to give thanks to the Lord? Why is he reminding the people that God's faithful love endures forever? Well, repetition indicates emphasis. It's because the Israelite people are facing a bit of a crisis that was threatening everyone. They were fearful and uncertain. They had an enemy that almost seemed to be encroaching on all sides of them. No one was safe. And I think we can relate to that situation where we find ourselves today. Let me ask you a question. Have the events of the past four weeks in Canada and around the world caused you to be fearful? Has it caused you to be uncertain, maybe a little anxious? Do you ever feel like the enemy is closing in around you? And what have you done with those feelings? Have you cried out to God or have you drawn into yourself? Have you moved closer to Jesus or have you moved further away? I talked to a woman this week who was almost apologetic when she said to me, Paul, it feels like I'm praying all the time, as if she felt like somehow she was being a nuisance to God. No, 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 the act of prayer is moving beyond our own story and choosing to live in God's greater story and to fully trust in his provision because he loves us always and forever. Look how the psalmist responds as it seems like the enemy is closing in on him. Look at verse 5. In my distress, I prayed to the Lord. In my distress, I prayed to the Lord. See, the psalmist is faced with these trying times, and in the midst of it, he turns to the Lord. Do you know how people usually respond to fear, or they respond to anxiety or pain? We tend to hide, don't we? Just think, we see a scary movie, we pull the covers over our face, we isolate ourselves, we go into seclusion. We turn inwards and we shut others out, thinking that we can handle it on our own. And many of you know what I'm talking about because you do it. And that can be a lonely, isolated, and a scary place when we're all by ourselves. Last winter, Carolyn and I did a renovation to our bathroom, and we were just putting some of the finishing touches on it, adding a few accessories. It was a little later in the night. I was tired, and so I took one of those box cutters out of the contractor's toolbox that he had left behind, and, and I tried to cut the price tag off the towel, and, and it slipped, and, and all of a sudden, the blade went into the fleshy part at the base of my thumb. And it was almost surreal. I was in shock as I thought, that's in a fair ways. This really should hurt. And then the blood started coming out. And, and I tried to hide it. I didn't want Carolyn to see it. So I put toilet paper around it and I wrapped it up and I put it in my pocket. And that's when the blood ro rolled down my leg. No, not really. But Carolyn took notice of it. 
And, and that's where she wanted to make sure that I got medical assist, assistance. But I didn't want to have to make her drive me to the ER and then have to wait hours just because of my carelessness. But she insisted, let me tell you, in times like that, it was good to have someone beside me, to hold my hand, and to walk with me in my fear and in my trepidation. Now, this is why I have to hire someone to do renovations in my house. And Carolyn has now banned me from using box cutters on anything. In the text, instead of turning in, the psalmist here in the text turns out and acknowledges he can't handle it himself. He needs help, and so he cries out to the Lord. In my distress, I prayed to the Lord. And look how the Lord responds at verse 5. And the Lord answered me, and he set me free. He set me free. See, God's story of redemption, the Easter story, is all about setting us free and saving us. And that's what the psalmist is getting at here in the text. By trusting in the Lord, he has saved us and he has set us free. But sometimes we lose sight of that, don't we? We get so caught up in our own little story, we get caught up in our own problems and concerns that we can forget about a heavenly father that, had, that we can reach out to that loves us with a steadfast love and wants nothing more for us than to call out to him, to acknowledge our need for him and to live in his story. As many of you are aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a direct impact on North Park Church. Martin and Mika Postma were longtime members here at North Park. Martin served faithfully as a church treasurer for years. About the middle of March, he and Mika contracted the virus and both were admitted in the hospital. In fact, they both ended up in the ICU in serious condition. Thankfully, Mika was able to recover and is now at home, but Martin, he was not able to overcome it. And on Friday, March 27th, he became the first Londoner to die from the virus. Now, I don't know if we can truly understand what this family has gone through. Mika and the children were not even able to be at Martin's side in his final hours. They weren't able to hold his hand and to comfort him. When notified of Martin's death, his children gathered at the window of the Postma home where Mika was still in isolation. And that's how they grieved together. That's the way they comforted each other, not able to hug one another, but through a pane of glass. Can you imagine? When I talked to Mika last week, I was amazed at her faith. Through tears, she reflected on the 52 years of marriage, and she grieved the circumstances and the impact that Martin's death had on her, his having on her family and their friends. But then she chose to see the greater story of God's hand and provision in it all. She said to me, Paul, I can't explain it, but God has just given me this, this sense of peace during this difficult time. God was providing for her. And that grief and that sadness, that darkness that seems to be closing in on her, it will dissipate in time, and she will be reunited with Martin one day. That's God's greater story. That's the story of Easter, captured in that familiar passage in John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, darkness does not get the last word in God's story. Death could not contain Jesus, and it cannot contain those who put our trust in him. We're part of a bigger story. We don't have to stay in our fear or our pain and in our grief. In fact, the psalmist says in Psalm 118.6, the Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. Isn't that important for us to remember these days? The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. Look as the passage continues. Psalm 118 at verse 6. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Yes, the Lord is for me. He will help me. I will look in triumph at those who hate me. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in people. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in people. What people do you trust? Just think of your life. Think of the moment right now. Who do you trust? Is it family members, maybe a spouse or a boyfriend, girlfriend? Maybe it's just a best buddy. In a recent poll conducted in October 2019, it covered 22 countries and over 20,000 people. It found that we're most likely to trust those who provide an essential service rather than those who sell a product or an ideology. Therefore, scientists, doctors, and teachers are trusted professions. Now, on the contrast that to politicians and advertising executives, and I'm sad to say this, clergy, 
we are seen to be the least trusted professions. Now, in the midst of this pandemic, with the leaders carrying out daily news conferences and updates, who has been the trusted voice that you've listened to? Is it Ford? Is it Trudeau? Is it Trump? Is it Dr. Theresa Tam, the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada? Is it Dr. Chris Mackey, the Medical Officer of Health for Middlesex, London? You know who it's become for many? It's Dr. Anthony Fauci, the U.S. Director of Infectious Diseases. He has become the most trusted voice in the midst of all of this chaos. He's even become an unlikely celebrity, with his face appearing on everything from donuts to coffee mugs and even T-shirts with the slogan, In Dr. Fauci We Trust. See, in times like this, we have to have someone that we can trust. We're looking for direction from someone, anyone who will lead us and guide us and tell us what we need to do. It's important to follow the, their directives of those who have been placed in those positions of trust. But what the psalmist is referring to in this text, to trust in people, is when we build our lives around the approval of others. Oh, it feels good when someone takes a romantic interest in us, doesn't it? or when we're praised or we're complimented for our looks or for our intellect or for our talent. But when we live too much in that story, the story where it's all about us, it makes us too needy for affirmation. It makes us too devastated by criticism, too starry-eyed about celebrity. And to trust in princes, that's to make an idol out of power, to become consumed with influential friends and to need to be in control of our destiny. See, to live our lives trusting in people leaves us increasingly more lonely and disappointed because guess what? People will eventually let us down. Have you ever had that experience where you put your trust in someone and they just let you down? It's because humanity, we're flawed. Given time, I'm going to eventually let my children and my wife down because I'm flawed. See, the psalmist understood this from his own experiences. Putting your ultimate confidence and trust in another human being is misplaced. And that's why he repeats himself in this text. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mere mortals. See, our God is worthy of our confidence. His faithful love endures forever. No matter how great the danger, in his love and his goodness, God will provide for us. Do you believe that? Has that been your experience? Try it. Try giving it all to Jesus, all your fear, all your anxiety, everything that you're holding in, all the worries and all the concerns. Just try it. Give it to him and see if he can be trusted. Where do you see yourself trusting more in people than Jesus these days? You know, there's been a lot written and shared about how to make the most of our time now that many of us are housebound and by the way, I should just say, we assume that everyone's housebound and has all this time on their hands, but this pandemic has hit people in different ways. There are some that are more busy now than they've ever been, so we can't assume that everyone has spare time. But there's been a lot circulating about how to use that spare time, hasn't there? There's no shortage of creative suggestions online. You can do exercises classes, you can do art classes, uh, you can learn how to play a musical instrument, you can learn a second language. There's all sorts of courses that are being offered online for children and for adults. There's all sorts of things that you can do. All great opportunities, but the majority of them seem to be focused on us, on our story, on ourselves. There seems to be significantly less offered in the way that we can grow our relationship with God. And that's strange because we're in this season of Lent and we're at Easter Sunday. All these services that people telling us what we can do with our time is a daily focus on ourselves. We need less of, about ourselves and we need to know how we can focus more on building our story and our life with God's story, aligning it with the Easter story. Let me offer you a few suggestions of just some things that if you have some time at this season of your life, the way that you can actually invest in God's story in your relationship with God. Here's a few suggestions. During this time, why don't you try these activities? Number one, read a book. But read a book that encourages your soul. My wife Carolyn is self-isolating at the cottage while I spend most of the week here in London. She just buzzed me this week and she asked if I would mind bringing up a couple of C.S. Lewis books. Now, they're books that she's read before, 
but she wants to use this time to reread them because they're good for her soul. They connect her with God. And I would encourage you to do that as well. And if you need some titles or some examples of good books, just let us know. We'd be glad to pass them along. Number two, the second thing that you can do, stay engaged with North Park. And we all know that North Park is not the building, it's the people. I mean, some of you may miss the actual building and being in here, but we miss each other more, don't we? There are so many opportunities that we can use to connect online through the prayer meetings that we're doing. There's electives that are being offered for all ages. Those are still going on. I miss seeing all of you in your faces, but let me tell you this. When I see you pop up on Zoom, it lifts my spirits. When we see everyone popping up on Zoom, it lifts all of our spirits, and it connects us back to God's bigger story of what he's doing through this church and through his people. So stay connected at North Park. Number three, serve. Continue to serve in the ways that you're able by calling someone who's maybe lonely, reaching out, and just buzzing someone, sending them an email, and just saying you're thinking of them. Offer to get groceries for someone or some other practical gesture. Or participate in some of the serving opportunities that we do here at North Park. The ways that we've vetted some things so that we stay within the restrictions. Many of you donated to the grab of snacks that, that we collected that we were able to distribute to the frontline health care workers. Last week, many of you purchased each Easter lilies to distribute to your neighbors and co-workers as a practical gesture of love and encouragement. And through doing that purchase, you also raised money for mission services and you helped a dear guy with a business trying to sell his Easter lilies when he would have wasted it all. You guys supported him and we're thankful for that. Let's continue to look for ways to be a blessing to those around us. But remember, watch your physical distancing. Number four idea, watch a movie. Yeah, you never thought you'd hear a pastor tell you to watch a movie, but here's the caveat. Watch a movie with an edifying theme. See, many of us are binge-watching television series or movies on Netflix or Crave, but instead of Tiger King, why not consider a movie that represents the significance of the season of Easter? What about Jesus of Nazareth or The Passion of Christ? These are powerful movies that help us take our eyes off of our own story and connect us with God's greater story. Carolyn and I watched a football movie just a couple of days ago. It was called Greater, and it was amazing, the hopeful theme of this movie. Number five, use social media, but use it for a mission. Most of us are on social media now more than ever before, but try avoiding filling your head and your heart with the frivolous. Instead, leverage what you like, leverage what you repost, leverage what you retweet for something bigger than yourself. Use it to promote Christian messages of God's greater story. Promote the weekend services at North Park or on Instagram or Facebook. Promote the electives that we have because what that does is it expands our reach there are people that would never feel comfortable walking in the doors of our building when we're open and sitting here and listening to a message, but they may listen to one online if they see you, one of their friends, liking it. And number six, reestablish a daily quiet time with God. And maybe this is an area that's been lacking in your life lately. See, it can be so easy just to get out of a habit and again become so focused on our own life and our own concerns and our own story but now maybe you find yourself with a little more time. Steward it well. Every day, try and engage God's story as revealed through Scripture, and then invite God to show you the way that you fit into it. These are just six fairly easy ways that help us to shift our focus away from our own story and our tendency to put our trust and confidence in people and instead grow a greater wonder and awe and trust in the way that we fit into God's story, the Easter story, and the way that we seek refuge in the Lord. Let's look back at the text, Psalm 118, and we see from verses 10 to 18, it describes the crisis that the psalmist has found himself in. This experience brought to him the realization that God is a refuge more powerful than any crisis he may encounter. Fear can be a powerful reality, but refuge in God and his grander story for our lives brings us hope, even in the face of calamity. And then the psalm ends from verses 19 to 29. It's its conclusion. And in that conclusion, it expresses thanksgiving to God who has delivered the people and saved them. Just listen to a part of what it says, verse 19 to 21. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, 
and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and for giving me victory. Thank you, Lord, for giving me victory. When I focused on you and not on me, not on my own worries, not on my own trivialities, when I focused on you, you gave me victory. Thank you, Lord. Now, as this passage concludes, we have two verses that may sound familiar to us. It's because there are words that are used to describe Jesus in the New Testament. They're words that get to the very essence of what the Christmas or what the Easter story is all about. See, as well as being a thanksgiving and a worship song, Psalm 118 is also a messianic psalm. That means that it points to the coming of Jesus and his role in saving humanity. Just listen to verse 22 and see if it sounds familiar. This is in the Old Testament, Psalm 118, verse 22. But see if it sounds familiar. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Does that sound familiar? It's because it's quoted at least five times in the New Testament. These are the words that Jesus himself recites in Matthew 21 at verse 42. You know, just after he made that triumphant entry into Jerusalem on a donkey in the final week of his earthly life, he's addressing to the religious leaders of the day who are questioning him, by what authority are you doing that? By what authority are you healing people? Jesus uses these words to indicate that although he has been chosen and sent by God to save humanity, he will be rejected and he will be crucified by his own people. But that won't hinder God's story from going forward. Jesus will be the cornerstone of the church. He will be the cornerstone in which the church is built upon. He will be the foundation. And once the cornerstone is in place, it will determine how everything else is measured. And look at the second verse in the conclusion of Psalm 118 that may be familiar to you. It's at verse 26. It says, Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Now again, this verse is used on more than one occasion in the New Testament. These are the very words that the people greet Jesus with as he rides into Jerusalem in the final week of his life. In Luke 19 at verse 38, they cry out, Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you remember when Jesus entered Jerusalem on the last week of his life? The people set up a bit of a parade route, and they were waving palm branches and shouting to Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means our God saves or please save us. Through this action, they're acknowledging that Jesus is the one who's come in the name of the Lord. He is the one that represents God, and he comes with authority. They see Jesus as the Messiah who will come and save them and bring about the kingdom of God. But these people who are shouting Hosanna to him along this parade route at the beginning of the week, they're the same people that spit on him and mock him and beat him and jeer him with shouts of crucify him as Jesus walked another parade route just five days later. It was a road that led him to Golgotha, which ultimately took him to his destiny, the cross. Why their sudden change of heart? It's because they couldn't see past their own story. They couldn't see past their own story, their own difficulties, their own enemy that seemed to be encircling them. They were distraught that Jesus didn't appear to be the sort of Messiah that they were expecting. He wasn't the type of Messiah that they had always envisioned. See, they wanted a king that would conquer the enemies and eliminate all the problems so they could just coast on through life. But Jesus didn't do that, so they had him killed. They couldn't see God's greater story, that Jesus came not just to save people from sin, but to save them from each other and to save them from their own selfish inclinations. But the people couldn't see that, even though the prophets had been talking about it for generations. And before we're too hard on them, I think for many of us, we also can be, lose sight of the way that God is at work in us, the way that God is at work all around us, the way that God is at work in the midst of a global pandemic. God is at work bringing everything back together again. Do you see him? God's saving of Jesus, even from death, is the ultimate display of his goodness, of his provision, that his faithful love endures forever. Because of Jesus' resurrection, all who believe in him will conquer death itself. Doesn't that just compel you to give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his faithful love endures forever? Do you remember when we launched this series on Psalms way back on March 7th, 8th weekend, back in the good old days. 
when we used to do church live. Do you remember we launched the service, and at the end of the services, we had you respond by just coming forward to the front. We had paper and we had pens on tables, and we just encouraged you. What's God saying to you? How is he challenging you? On a little piece of paper, just write down a prayer or maybe a concern or, or, or maybe something that's on your mind. And once you're done, just lay them up along the front of the auditorium. We did this before we had any idea the upheaval that COVID-19 would bring to our lives. But you responded, and we received hundreds of little pieces of paper with heartfelt comments written on them. Well, what we've done this weekend is we've taken all of those cards that you shared a bit of your story about the things that you were immersed in or occupied your thoughts or your time, and we've placed them within God's greater story. We've pinned them up to God's greater story, which is represented by the cross. That's all of your comments that we were able to get from the first few weeks of this series. They represent your story, and we've placed them in the midst of God's grander story that's represented by the cross. See, it's at times like these that we truly become aware that our lives intersect two stories. In our story, it's the pain and the economic disaster of a pandemic. Or maybe it's the devastation of a health diagnosis. Or maybe it's a death or a marriage breakup. Or maybe it's a rebellious child or a disappointment or a betrayal. Or maybe it's a mental health issue or whatever it is for you. And it's real, isn't it? And it's scary, and it's, it's lonely at times. Maybe it even feels like life is so hopeless for you. But at times like this, we need to be reminded that we can take our eyes off of, our, off of ourselves, and we can shift our focus away from our own stories. And instead, we can choose to live in the story of Easter. We can choose to live in God's story. We can choose to put ourselves into a grander narrative. See, both stories impact us. Both stories matter, but the challenge to us may be which story do we truly choose to live in? Do we truly choose to live in our story, or do we live in God's story? Do we live in the Easter story? God has offered us his provision and his redemption, and he offered it to us through Jesus. That is the Easter story. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the ultimate story that shows victory coming out of defeat, strength coming out of weakness, life coming out of death, rescue coming from abandonment, love rising up from hate. Jesus has come to save us, and he is the very embodiment of God's faithful love that endures forever. So let me ask you today on this Easter Sunday, 2020, in the midst of all that's going on around us in the world, how do you respond to Jesus today? Are you still living in your own story? Or will you choose to live in his? This Easter, let's not just celebrate the resurrection. Let's practice it. We are living the resurrection every time we turn to God and we say, take it. I'm yours. Take this from me. It's yours, God, and I choose to live in you. I choose to live in your greater story. And when we do that, we're remembering God's promise that he will provide for us. He didn't leave his son hanging, literally, and he won't leave us hanging either. He has never left us alone. He is with us. And despite what the inner skeptic may say to us at time, God is fully trustworthy. God is fully able. And his faithful love endures forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, we hate to put significance or special emphasis on, on any particular Sunday, but this is like the Super Bowl of Christianity. This is Easter Sunday. This is a time where a lot of the world stands still and remembers the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And not just that Jesus died on the cross, but resurrected from the dead to give us new and eternal life when we put our faith in him. I mean, there are millions and millions of people around the globe that are remembering that. And, and admittedly, God, this year it comes with a little, bit of a, a little bit of a lament. We don't know what's going on. Admittedly, God, there's some of us that, that are a little anxious during this time. But the Easter story reminds us that your faithful love endures forever. You were faithful in the beginning. You loved us in the beginning, and you love us the same just now. God, may we live in that. 
May we sort of remove ourselves from the story that we've been trying to create for ourselves or live for ourselves, and may we jump into the story that you've created, the grander story that reminds us there, there is light in the midst of darkness. There is hope and despair that you are there for us and that you've saved us. For those of us who have been Christians a long time, God, I just pray that maybe we see Easter this year a little differently, that it becomes more poignant to us, more meaningful, that we really savor all that it means that Jesus has come for us. And for some of us, God, there's some here watching, I'm sure, that they've, they're new to faith or maybe they've never experienced the saving grace of Jesus. I pray this season that maybe that's a step that they want to take. They know that they've been living in their own story and that's just taken them down a different path that leads to all sorts of worry and anxiousness. I pray that today, God, they will choose to jump into your story, the Easter story, the story where you offer us hope and your redeeming love because your faithful love endures forever. Thank you, God, for this time. God bless us, and God, would you care for our global community? We're leaning on you, and we know that you will make a way. Bless us and keep us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.